hello everyone, my name is Sanjay Popat, I'm a medical oncologist in London and welcome to this e-cancer expert discussion. Today's topic is about EGFR exon 20 insertion mutant patients with advanced non-small cell uh, lung cancer and we've all just returned from the virtual uh, World Lung Cancer Congress armed with the latest data. I'm joined by my expert colleagues here, uh, Dr. Michael Thomas from Heidelberg, uh, my colleague Marina Garasino from uh, Milan, my colleague Rosario Campello from Galicia, and also my colleague Enriqueta Philippe from Barcelona. I hope we've got plenty uh, to discuss. So the first thing is about these EGFR exon 20 uh, insertions. Um, uh, how are we actually finding these in Europe? Um, for the UK, NGS is really not very common. It's only just started and many centers are using PCR-based techniques. And I worry that we're not picking up uh, these patients uh, enough. Uh, Michael, how are things in Germany? Well, we have a broad scope on EGFR alterations. It's very important, as you already mentioned, to have an in-depth analysis. And here, NGS is the best way how to approach that. And uh, so saying that uh, in our institution, we employ that uh, already for several years. And it's broadly spread, spread over Germany in, in a network, which is quality assured. So this provides good opportunity to get familiar with EGFR alterations, and in particular, Exxon 20 here, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Exxon 20 uh, insertion is an important one, which accounts for around, you know, 50 to 60% of Exxon 20 alterations. Thank you. And what's the situation in uh, Italy, uh, Marina? So we are uh, in uh, a very jeopardized situation because there are uh, academic centers doing uh, NGS to all patients. But there are small centers around the country where they just do the test for available drugs. So uh, there is a situation, and the number also of NGS platform in Italy, they are not enough to cover all the all uh, all the landscape. I think we have this problem uh, everywhere in Europe and uh, Spain. Enriqueta, how, how was the landscape of genotyping for EGFR? The situation is pretty similar. So there are a number of institutions that, uh, yes, we are doing NGS, but in general, NGS is not really high implemented for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. So there are a lot of patients that are tested with PCR-based uh, technologies. And even in some institutions, we are doing both. We are starting with uh, uh, EGFR. Uh, ALK by uh, 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 immunostochemistry, ROS, and PDL1. And then for those patients that are negative, we perform NGS and we have the results, but sometimes not just before starting treatment. Thank you. And Rosario, we had uh, data at the World Lung Congress uh, from a couple of data sets from Flatiron and AACR Project uh, Genie. Uh, do you want to comment on how common these EGFR exon 20 insertions uh, are? Well, uh, thank you so much for the question. I think that this presentation has been very useful and they saw the increasing interest we have in this kind of genetic alteration. So we, we have new drugs, we have very appealing drugs, very active drugs. So uh, there is this uh, interest uh, in, in, in finding these alterations. What we have seen is that NGS can detect uh, with m m more frequency these alterations, even um, more than 50 times compared to a conventional PCR. And also we can detect different variants from the genetic alteration. It's going to be important probably in the near future how these different variants can predict uh, the efficacy of a specific targeted agent. So very interesting data, real world data from the World Conference in Lung Cancer, yes. Yeah, thank you. And, and Michael, at the moment, many tests just simply say exon 20 insertion positive or, or negative or mutation present or absent. Is it is that adequate or do we really need to know the genotype to, to best treat these patients? What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, for the time being, of course, it would be important to really receive the information. Is there an exon 20 insertion? Yes or not? Because treatment options are arising at the horizon. Uh, when looking in the future, and Rosario already mentioned that, 
uh, we, we, we get known to a molecular, a molecular landscape, you know, on the distribution of the different alterations. For instance, we could differentiate between those ones which are in the loop following the C helix or those ones in the C helix. Of course, there is, this is an, um, you know, a, a preponderance for loop following C helix. This accounts for around 90 or more than 90% of alterations. And here the conventional TKIs do not work. Conventional TKIs might work sometimes in certain defined alterations in the C helix, but uh, though, though, so it's important to know it for these reasons. And in the future, might be uh, even the opportunity, you know, to sequence treatments or to target a certain alteration with a certain type of treatment like TKI or antibody. So for the future, it might matter to know that landscape. And for the time being, it's very important to get known at all. Is there an exon 20 insertion? Yes or not? Thank you. And my, my question then is to um, Marina, how are these patients currently being treated? I mean, in the UK, if they're identified, they generally get platinum doublet chemotherapy, platinum uh, pemetrexid, the combination with um, uh, pembrolizumab or immunochemo is generally not given because these are excluded from the 189 reimbursement. But in the UK, we do have access to the Empower 150 regime up front, and some of these patients are being treated with that. What, what is the landscape in, in Italy at the moment? Uh, well, the situation is very similar to, to UK, but we are allowed to use the, the Keynote 189 regimen that potentially exclude just uh, Exxon 19 and uh, Exxon 20. What we know is that in general, patients with driver mutations do not respond very well to immunotherapy. But uh, again, we do not have data for uh, this, this particular population with the exome 20. Today, the scenario is evolving. I think that we do not have an answer yet because we have multiple drugs giving uh, uh, new drugs giving uh, a response rate, but again, the response rate is in the range of uh, 40, 50 percent. So I think that in, in the next future, we will have to clarify if to start with chemo, IO, or uh, with the targeted agents. And uh, I believe also that the safety of the new drugs, the PFS of the new drugs, and together with the response rate, will clarify in the future what will be the best strategy? Thanks, Marina. I'll, I'll ask uh, Enriqueta next. We had some, you know, exciting data with these new drugs. Uh, I think one of the drugs that we've all been looking forward to seeing some mature data is Mobocertinib, uh, previously known as TAC788. And Dr. Zhu presented uh, data from the Exclaim uh, ongoing uh, trial. Do you, do you want just to uh, uh, summarize what some of that data showed, uh, Enriqueta? No, I think I think the data uh, look uh, very good. So in this situation, post platinum chemotherapy, uh, the agent was associated with a response rate of approximately 30%, 26% according to the independent review committee, 35% according to the investigator, and a median progression free survival of around seven months. So this is something that is changing because our experience with uh, TKIs in these patients with exon 20 insertions is really limited with the uh, PFS with the uh, approved drug uh, we of uh, only uh, two or two point three months. So I think really uh, good uh, information in these patients with a difficult alteration to target. And uh, one of the things that I noticed in the presentation, there's quite a high adverse event uh, rate. So I, I think I saw about 20% grade three uh, diarrhea rate. And that, that re reminds me a lot of our experience with Afatinib. We've, we've seen that sort of uh, rate rate before. Rosario, what, what are your thoughts on the adverse events that uh, we, we saw with uh, Mobocertinib? I think this is the, one of the most important aspects of this new agent. Uh, how are we going to manage toxicity adverse events? Since the activity seems very promising, I, I, I am uh, really worried about this uh, grade three adverse events because it can impact 
negatively impact in terms of quality of life. Maybe lower doses, we have to check how this work works with lower dose and how we can implement the management of this toxicity, but it can be a challenge. In my experience, it has, it has been a challenge to treat these patients. We have to take into account that these patients have been treated with many lines of therapy previously, so maybe the situation, the clinical situation is not such as good as the first line setting, but again, I think that toxicity is going to be a challenge with these new agents. Yeah, thank you. We I don't think I saw any data by genotype, uh, Michael. Um, you know, we previously discussed the specific genotype and perhaps maybe a difference in binding of the kinase uh, and that might result in heterogeneity of responses. We saw a median PFS of about 7.3 months, but the duration of response was 17.5 months. And to me, that sort of implied that if you responded, you responded very well, but overall, uh, there might be some heterogeneity. Do you think I'm reading too much into the data or and it's a statistical quirk, or do you think there is some heterogeneity in outcomes? Well, I think you nicely picked uh, the piece of the data, which, you know, uh, gives uh, consideration to think further forward. And th this is the difference, you know, between uh, the mobile serotonin trial, the duration of response, and if you compare it to amivantamab, for instance, there we have a readout, which is not so long, which, which gives a little bit the impression, okay, what are those responders and which types of, you know, insertions are responding to mobile serotonin? We don't know it yet. It has not been analyzed up to my knowledge. But what we have seen, and this is the reason why I mentioned it, that uh, we have in the C helix some alterations which you can really pinpoint, which is, for instance, ACE763. Uh, ACE, uh, I just yeah. reminded. Yeah. Yeah. And this one is nicely responding to the conventional TKIs. This is the only one. And uh, the rest not. And knowing that there might be a difference. So I think it's quite intriguing to step further forward with this perspective that you just, uh, that you, just you know, uh, mentioned. So I think we're very much looking forward to some more, more data being, yeah. being presented in due course. And similarly, as you, as you discussed, uh, we had this uh, other new data set from the Chrysalis uh, study presented by my colleague, Dr. Sabari. This is using the uh, EGFR met bispecific uh, drug amivantamab with one arm uh, activating uh, uh, EGFR and the other arm uh, met. And uh, Marina, we heard uh, uh, the extension cohort uh, efficacy data uh, with again a similar response rate of 40% duration of response just just under a year, uh, progression-free survival of 8.3 8 months. You know what is it? What is your take on, on that on that data? Uh, how do you, how do you think uh, that that would fit in our paradigm? Yeah, so we have now multiple possibilities because we have potiotinib, we have mobosertinib, we have amivantanab, and so the, uh, the results are interesting and 8.3 is the best progression free survival that we had. And uh, the toxicity profile seems also better compared to uh, the other compounds. So clearly we will have to see more data. We will have to understand uh, when to use uh, uh, this bispecific before in the beginning of the story of the disease or in a second part, but the progression free survival together with the better toxicity profile can be something very important for our patients. And I agree with Michael that we have to create also education around the family of exon 20 because they are not all the same. So maybe also in the next future, we will see some particular subgroup uh, that benefit more and they will go immediately with the, with the drug. So we are accumulating data and uh, in process. We're living in exciting times. We have new, new uh, uh, drugs coming through. And with the amivantin of Enriqueta, we have some unusual uh, toxicities we have. Uh, the EGFR effects with skin toxicities. We also have the MET effects with uh, pedal edema, uh, but also this drug uh, has uh, infusion reactions and it has to be currently given intravenously every every two weeks. So 
What are your what are your thoughts on the adverse events, bearing in mind the other drug, which is also targeting the same population, whilst oral has issues with uh, uh, diarrhea as its main main problem? Yeah, I, I have to say that yes, infusion reactions is something that uh, we have to face. But in our experience, and what uh, was presented is that are really mild, and uh, these reactions are not impacting uh, on the on the treatment. So. I think my experience with amibantanab, and I have participated in the trial, is that the agent is uh, well tolerated in general. I have not seen a lot of anti-met uh, toxicity in, uh, in our patients. And yeah, there is some kind of uh, rush, but uh, as medical oncologists and treating uh, with other uh, EGFR TKIs, we are used to, to treat this, uh, this toxicity. So infusion reactions, but not really important and will not impact the treatment outcome in the patients. Great, thank you. And Rosario, we had a, an update on the Zenith uh, uh, 20 trial. This is a posiotinib uh, trial. Posiotinib is another uh, EGFR kinase inhibitor. I would say that the, the, the data of the once daily dosing that we've seen so far have lower response rates. Uh, here we had about a 15% response yeah. rate uh, reported and a, sm a lesser progression-free survival, 4.2 uh, months. It's also quite a, quite a toxic drug with a high rate of grade three diarrhea, about 30%. How do you think this, this drug, posiotinib, is comparing with the other options that are coming through uh, mobocertinib and uh, amivantamab? Well, with the, with the data we have so far, I think that uh, the pro main problem we have with posiotinib is the, the less efficacy in terms of response rate and PFS, as you have mentioned. But overall, I would say that toxicity profile is the main uh, problem we have with this agent. Uh, so um, we have to wait for the results, testing new uh, doses. But so far, I would say that uh, amivantamab or mobisertinib uh, can do better than posiotinib. Thanks. And Michael, one of the problems that these patients have uh, as the natural history of disease progresses is brain metastases. Uh, uh, we, you know, we see this quite frequently in patients with EGFR mutation. Uh, I, I worry that with amivantamab being an a antibody, we're not going to get much brain penetration. With um, TAC-788 mobile, certainly we had a, a lower responses in, in patients with CNS metastases. We haven't seen any brain-specific data. You know, is, is this a vulnerability across, across all of these drugs that we're going to have to be concerned about? Or do you think this will just settle down in the end? Well, uh, of course, this is an important point. As we know, at the key point of diagnosis, we, we get aware of around 20% of patients with brain meds in stage 4 disease. And over time, if you, uh, if you follow over the disease trajectory, it might increase up to 40%. And we have learned from the uh, exclaim data that have been shown, as you mentioned, that in patients with brain meds, that there are responses, something around you know 18 to 20%. Uh, in this subgroup, in, with amivantanab, uh, nothing in this direction has been shown. It, it's, it's difficult because it's an antibody and we know that this might not uh, penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so this is something where we would have to establish, you know, management strategies. And uh, personally, I, I would perceive, you know, as we know from, you know, other uh, molecular altered types of disease, uh, there might be a lot of brain meds, but not so large. And here we even start to employ, um, you know, a stereotactic radiotherapy, even up to eight to 10 brain meds, if the size is less than two centimeters. So brain management matters. Mobosertinib shows some activity and it's important to keep this in mind in the future. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, so if we're thinking about where we're going in this field, Marina, at the moment, all of these uh, data sets have been in patients who've progressed post-platinum. Uh, uh, we're seeing some first-line trials with these newer agents ongoing. Uh, we have the um, Papillon trial in the first-line setting mm -hmm. of chemotherapy carboplatin pemetrexid with amivantanamab. And also with uh, MOBO Certinib, we have a first line trial of MOBO uh, Certinib versus chemotherapy. Do, do you think these drugs are really suited for the first line setting, or we need to optimize their function uh, uh, better in the second line setting? What are your thoughts? 
Yes, this is a good question because uh, we know that uh, they do not have uh, 70, 80 percent of response rate like uh, for exon 19 and exon 21. So uh, it, clearly we would like to increase uh, the uh, number of responses in these patients and so maybe one drug could be not enough and this is why are so important the combination trials. Uh, uh, maybe in the future, when we will be and we will understand better the biology uh, behind the exon 20, maybe I, I foresee that there will be a group with the single agent and maybe another group with the combination with chemo or uh, something like that. So I think that in the next future, we will be maybe we will be able to personalize also the rare family. Thank you. And uh, Enriqueta, one of uh, the options that my colleagues in the US seem to use quite a lot for these exon 20 insertions is high dose osimertinib off, off label. Uh, Zosia Petreski presented a cohort of data at ASCO with about a 25% uh, response rate. Obviously, we, we're used to using osimertinib. We, we like the uh, adverse event profile. How does that stack up against this data? Do you think that's that's really viable? And you know, we have a different regulatory and reimbursement uh, environment in in, in Europe. Um, uh, where, where do you think that's going to fit in? Yeah, the reality is that uh, at least in Spain, we are not able to give uh, osimertinib at double the dose in this indication. I have to say that even the study presented, the results are modest. So we need, uh, I think, other treatment approaches in this group of patients. So yeah, I think 25% you mentioned, but uh, PFS is uh, short. So I think uh, there is a need for new treatment strategies. We are not uh, usually treating these patients uh, in Spain. I think Europe with osimertinib uh, at a higher dose. So I think things will settle down over the course of the next few months as we uh, await uh, more data. And certainly we have these ongoing first line trials and uh, with mobocertinib and amivantamab. And I, for one, am very interested to, to see how these, these come out. Do we think we're going to get any better patient selection to, to allow us to use one drug over the other, Michael? Um, you know, will we be doing NGS at baseline as you've so well organized in Germany and perhaps preferentially selecting those with MET uh, uh, amplification for uh, amivantamab over mobocertinib? What's your vision of the future? Well, good remark. I think uh, the first line trials could help to elucidate this in this direction. And here it would be really good, you know, to have the paraffin embedded blocks in collection and do this analysis even potentially with commutations. And what might be interesting, you know, uh, in the Papillon trial, of course, Amivantamab, as Marina mentioned, is tested in conjunction with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy by its own. And the question is, is it, you know, the type of molecular alteration or is it a certain prerequisite of the microenvironment already given upfront? So uh, there, it could be of interest to look on the molecular phenotype in conjunction with nanostring-based analysis to have some proxies on the cellular environment. But you know, this is grasped widely in the future, but uh, it would be really good to have in-depth analysis in the first-line trials. Thank you. And Marina, at the moment, these, tr these, these uh, drugs and these trials are fairly much staying in the post-platinum setting at the moment. This is where we expect they'll, they'll be um, access uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, we know with osimertinib, we have to be careful if patients are pre-primed with checkpoint inhibitors because of uh, osimertinib trigger, triggering iotoxicities. Do you think we, we need to be worried about that with mobocertinib? And I presume we don't need to worry about that with amivantamab because it's a monoclonal, but you know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so uh, the, 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 the answer is that we don't know very well. So, but anyway, combining immunotherapy with TKI can be always uh, uh, dangerous. So at least the period of WASHAP could be important. And we have always to remember that uh, with the driver mutations, uh, immunotherapy does not work uh, very, very well. So. Uh, so I think that uh, it will balance between the story of the patient, the possibility to have a washout, and then again, we will have uh, an increase of data. 
but never combine at least dosi with chemo because with the immuno because we saw in the past uh, disasters. <laughs> we stay away from that that, that combination. And then we catch at the moment without access to these drugs, uh, some physicians are trying the um, second generation EGFR kinase inhibitors like afatinib or dacamitinib for specific genotypes. Do you think that that practice will still stay embedded or that will disappear once we have these, these drugs available? I think if we don't have uh, any clinical trial, uh, at least in Spain, what happened is that the patients are treated with first-line chemotherapy, no, Rosario, in some cases chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, but not in all patients. And in, uh, if in second line we don't have any clinical trial or we don't have access to any compassionate use, we can try with a fatinib, but we know that the response rate is less than 10%. So if we have available the possibility to treat the patient in post-platinum with a compassionate use with um, or centimib or amivantanap, I think this could be the treatment of choice in our patients. And at the moment, Rosario, if we're seeing a patient with metastatic disease, they have high pd one 100%. Should these patients be starting off with first-line Pembro? Is there data to support that? I don't think we have enough data to support that. Um, I, I, we have more retrospective data showing the benefit of treating these patients with conventional platinum-based chemotherapy, and the data are not so bad in, with a Pemetroset combination. So <laughs> For me, it would be the, the best way to treat these patients in the first line setting in case I, ha I don't have any clinical trial. So far, I prefer to be uh, cautious regarding the use of immunotherapy in this population. Uh, I like much more the, the idea of trying the anti-angiogenic agents in this patient population. It could be an option, uh, but let's see if we have more data before starting to do it in our daily clinical practice. Great, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues for joining me on this discussion. It's been a fantastic uh, discussion about uh, this rare type of mutation, who these patients are, how we're currently treating them and where we're going with the latest data. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this excellent discussion. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.